with uh, just uh, an, an, an intro. Um, so uh, you'll be hearing from um, all, of, all of these speakers and I'll, I'll let them um, introduce uh, themselves um, um, as we get to their sessions. Uh, but to start, uh, I shared earlier the agenda notes that we have in a Google Doc. Uh, so we'll be using that later uh, for collaborative uh, notes and for our, our breakout sessions. Um, so hopefully for the people that are coming in right now, um, we can share those notes again uh, shortly. Uh, and um, just to frame uh, our, our, our webinar, our call, um, when we or originally got together all the speakers, um, we highlighted some of these key points that um, the themes that we wanted to sort of address in, in, in this webinar. And uh, some of the things that came, came up um, is that the researcher is central to the work that we're doing. I think oftentimes um, we're sort of building infrastructure um, and including the researchers is, is, is invaluable to that work. Uh, understanding their workflows and, and, and tapping into their workflows is, is crucial. Um, the other thing is the um, data management plans as a living resource. So we, you know, we heard from earlier sessions about um, machine uh, actionable DMPs and having that sort of be something that evolves as the research uh, uh, project progresses. And so this was a strong theme that we wanted to address too. The other one is it takes a village, it takes all stakeholders. And I think you can see that from uh, the presenters here. Um, we're coming from all different angles um, and then uh, funder influence. So um, the funders definitely have influence and you know, the, there's always sort of calls of how can, how can we include more to drive the researchers to do this and that. And I think uh, we'll be hearing a little bit about the funder side uh, uh, soon. And then the research culture and skills. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that's something that we're all or sort of always battling against is how, uh, the current norms and the way that researchers currently work and uh, their skill sets, uh, their, their training. So, you know, there's new tools and new approaches and uh, you know, that, that's something also to account for. The last thing is um, Thomas uh, um, shared this uh, helpful resource, this 10 principles um, for machine actionable data management plans. And I think he'll, he'll share it again, um, but it was another thing that we thought could help sort of guide uh, the conversation. Uh, so uh, ultimately from this session, um, we will um, hopefully develop a checklist and or a roadmap. So extending you know, some of the work that had been done in those principles. Um, and uh, sort of consider continuing this discussion if we feel um, that you know this is a good discussion and we want to continue um, it in different venues. So um, otherwise, uh, I think I'll, I'll um, move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker will be um, Maria. Hi everyone. I'll, I'll share my my slides now. It may take a little while. Let me know when they're up because I can see them up, but I, I know that it, it takes a while to show up on your side. Yeah, we see it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hi, so I, I'm, I'm Maria Cruz. I'm going to give the funders perspective on the data management plans. Uh, I work for the Dutch Research Council in the Netherlands. I am a policy advisor in the area of open science and I am responsible for our research data management policy. And just so for those who don't know NVO, the Dutch Research Council is the main research funder in the Netherlands and it funds scientific research at Dutch public research institutions. Data management plans have been a cornerstone, cornerstone of our uh, data management policy since it has been introduced in 2016. So it's actually five years since we uh, introduced our data management, uh, research data management policy. Uh, so since uh, 2006, uh, we required that research data resulting from uh, uh, the projects that uh, NVO funds that they should be made available as much as possible for reuse and they should be as open as possible, closed if necessary, and fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The, the policy is, is, is a two-pronged approach. Uh, we, uh, we 
include uh, four questions. Uh, uh, so a data management section in grant application forms to encourage, uh, mainly to encourage researchers to think about uh, data management at, at the very early stage, at the proposal stage. It's not yet uh, I, uh, included in, in grant assessment, but, it, but uh, it's there. And if uh, projects uh, if projects are awarded, then there's a requirement to uh, to to complete a data management plan that it has to be submitted four months after the project has been awarded, and the project that's a condition for the project to start. So a project cannot uh, start until the data management plan has been submitted and approved by the agency. Uh, that was it. the policy was introduced in 2016. In 2018, uh, we and VO championed the alignment of data management policies among research funders in Europe. Uh, we felt that uh, to make life easier for researchers, but also that, to, that, that it was important to agree on common standards on, on core requirements for data management plans so that at least across Europe, uh, funders are asking more or less uh, for the same thing when it comes to data management and data management plans. Uh, and, and in 2020, we implemented the core requirements for data management plans. Um, and, and again, uh, we also promoted actively uh, to other stakeholders and in particular research institutions uh, within the Netherlands. As Chris said, researchers are at the center. So to make life easier for researchers, we, uh, as a funder, accept uh, data management plans according to the templates uh, from this from uh, the research institutions, uh, the, the, home, the host institutions of the project holders, and and we also uh, require that these uh, data management plans uh, uh, are, are according to the the Science Europe core requirements for data management plans. Uh, challenges and opportunities, as I said, it's been five years since we introduced our policy. What are the challenges and are, what are the opportunities we see? First, the challenges. Um, it, it's hard. Uh, we have a policy, but it's hard to, to understand what the level of compliance is with our policy. So these are some of the questions we, we grapple with as a funder, but I think other funders and also research institutions have the same questions. Uh, yeah, we don't. We 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 understand uh, what paper like publications coming out of of the projects we fund. We know whether they are open access or not, but it's really hard to understand how many uh, published data sets underlie publications funded by by NVO. Uh, we also don't. It's hard to know whether they this data has been managed according to the fair principles, and in particular when data sets cannot be shared under an open an open license. Is the metadata made publicly available because fair and open uh, are intersecting, but not they are not the same thing. Fair doesn't mean open. And then repositories, where, where are these, these data sets and the metadata? And, and are, are, are they in trustworthy repositories? So these are all questions we have. Uh, and, and we see, uh, oh, and I also wanted to say, we, we uh, last year we, we uh, published a persistent identifier strategy to improve the capacity for analyzing the, the impact of the research we fund, and we'll be introducing uh, ORCID, uh, we'll be introducing an, a three persistent identifiers over the, the coming years, ORCID, uh, ROAR, which is a persistent identifier for institutions and grant IDs, and this should help us get a better understanding of the, the outcomes of our funding. Uh, but we also see machine actionable DMPs as an opportunity, and, and I'm, I'm going to mention machine actionable DMPs, but um, uh, one of the speakers in our session will, will tell you a lot more about what they are, but they promise to allow the exchange of information across research, research tools and systems, and this will for sure make like, life much easier for researchers. Uh, but because it will enable parts of the DMP to be automatically generated and shared across stakeholders. Uh, and, and we see, as a funder, we see this as an opportunity because, uh, and, and this is actually a quote from that, that article that Chris mentioned, the 10 principles for machine actionable data management plans, because individual DMPs would act as a hub to project level research outputs. And, and one of the principles, the, the, the principle number 10 for machine actionable data management plans is that DMPs should become, should be made publicly available. And that's the question I have for you today 
is should funders encourage or should funders require DMPs to made to be made publicly available? And, and that's the question I leave you. I think this question will be asked in the, in the, through the Mentimeter and, 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 and that's uh, what I had to say to you today. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop sharing now. Uh, Chris, uh, Ellie, should I start the Mentimeter? Or hey. will you start? Thank you, Maria. Yes, yes. Uh, I let me share my screen. So if I, I also paste in the chat where what you should uh, where you should go to menti.com and use this code. Uh, and I'm running that. Let's see. Can you see? Can you all see my screen, the menti? Sorry, I don't hear you, uh, or I don't see you. Yeah, I can see it now. The Menti? OK, perfect. So let's um, all go to menti.com, um, use the code 48077468. OK, uh, use also the information on the ch in the chat. And the, the first question is, uh, so the first three questions uh, are directed towards you. So we want to understand better how uh, familiar you are with DMPs, if you have been working with DMPs, uh, if you are now um, trying to, you know, enter this, uh, this area, um, and how you experience things. So how familiar are you with DMPs? Okay, most, the majority is very familiar, and we have some people that are familiar, and some people that uh, are now uh, starting to explore uh, the, the different components and different elements around the piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see 19 people, 21, great. Recorded already. Great. So we we are uh, mostly advanced uh, in this uh, in this session, which is nice. Uh, but we are also um, um, people that uh, are not that familiar. Okay. So let's please. I'll give you one minute. Okay. I'll give you one minute because I see only twenty one people voting. So I'll give you one minute to vote. So we'll move on to the next one. Okay, maybe you don't want to, so I'll move on to the next one. <laughs> Time to um, move on. <laughs> yes, what is your background? Mm -hmm. So we have people that have more technical um, competencies, but also people that uh, are competent with data and with, um, okay, with educational uh, methodologies, methods, research data management, librarians, researchers, perfect. IT researcher, project officer. People that are dealing with CRIS systems and services, data services. <laughs> People that are, uh, that have a background in law even, okay, to address the, okay. the legal aspects. So we're dealing with legal aspects. Great. So, twenty-one people have, uh, as as previously, twenty-one people have 
share their answers. So I think we can move on to the next one. Okay, so I see the impact that's good that we have a diverse set of people joining us. Uh, where are you located? Next question. We have North Carolina, Netherlands, Switzerland, Austria, Slovakia. I have to participate. In. I forgot, but that, that's fine. Someone will add Greece. I I, I feel like someone in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, please add Greece there. Okay, Singapore. Oh wow. Okay, so we have uh, people that are coming from Finland. People that are um, joining us from different parts of the world, uh, mainly uh, EU as expected, but also um, the US, uh, this is the north and, north and south uh, uh, areas of the world, like where was it also? Singapore also, Asia, okay, North Carolina. I like that more, more people are voting now, <laughs> are adding their, their, uh, their answer. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Nice, nice to have you here. Nice to meet all of you and exchange um, practices with you. And that is Maria's uh, question. Maria, if you would like to, uh, to, to moderate that. Yeah, just like the, the, the answer seemed the same, but I just like to get a, a sense whether funders should require or encourage. Uh, so it's the same sentence, but two different words. There's two, th th one word that changes between require and encourage. Seems encouraging is winning for now. Oh, uh, requires uh, is gaining some uh, hold. We have twenty one people uh, that participated, so I think uh, this is the the top uh, that, that that we have in the, on the Menti. Um, it's very close, right? Yeah, very close. Yeah, very so it's not, there's not a strong sense that it should be required instead of just encouraging. Some people feel encouraging is also uh, an option. So they all mm -hmm. feel that DMPs are useful. That's, that's good. Okay, so moving on to the next speaker. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's Hannah and I, and uh, I will share slides again. Um, so I, I'm joined, so I'm Chris Erdman and I'm the Assistant Director for Data Leadership at uh, the American Geophysical Union. And, and Hannah, if you're here, you can introduce yourself as well. Yep, I'm, I'm Hannah Smith. I'm a publisher in Earth and Space Sciences at Wiley and working closely with HU. Yeah, we work together uh, on a lot of things. Um, so uh, just to start, I, I just wanted to briefly go through um, sort of what AGU is doing in this space. And so um, one thing I always lead with is that um, our position statement on data is, is really a main driver for uh, us moving um, a lot of these sort of initiatives forward. Um, so improving our guidance and improving our workflows with, with regards to data and software citation and availability statements. Um, so it's a, it's a big part of uh, our, our mission. Um, and uh, you know, just recently, that that's where a lot of the work has gone into sort of driving um, improvements. So uh, we just recently streamlined our uh, data on software for authors guidance, um, and we're getting sort of good feedback so far that because it's direct and succinct, it tells people what they exactly need to do. That was the approach that we were trying to take, um, and so it's been it's been nice to hear uh, the feedback, but. Um, this is an evolving space and there's always work to be done uh, to improve it, um, but it, at least there you can see some of the work that we've done to provide guidance on availability statements and, uh, um, 
and you know uh, data citation. Um, in, in in addition to uh, information about models, where we get a lot of uh, questions, and our, our help desk, where we ask, also get a lot of questions, um, particularly about repository selection. Um, uh, so, sorry, I skipped. Uh, another thing that we uh, we're we're doing is we do a lot of sort of um, training and 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 guidance. Uh, so we work um, with schools and institutions. We do a lot of these webinars, and so some of the examples are we we did an early career researcher um, uh, a session not too long ago um, where we sort of help guide them through uh, things to expect when they get when it becomes time to publish things that they should expect for data and software. Uh, the other one is we, we worked with a, a, a student-led uh, community on, on data science in the aquatic, aquatic sciences and uh, along the similar, similar themes um, and received questions about tools and approaches from them. So that was really uh, valuable. And a upcoming one is with UCLA um, library where uh, we, we, we're partnering with, with the library and as a society to um, really, again, do same kind of um, uh, training and guidance around uh, data and software, but also just working collaboratively on that. So bringing our members uh, at UCLA um, to that session so we can work together. Um, and then uh, another thing we do is we do a lot of community work. Um, so this is just one example, <laughs> um, but it's it's a good one. And I encourage all of you to sign up um, for this WeShareData.org is a series we run um, where it brings um, societies and um, uh, publishers and, and uh, repositories um, together. And also a bigger contingent that's been um, uh, showing up at these sessions is, is libraries too. So. Um, but we, we, we run these sessions uh, uh, on various topics and you can see here around journal data policies is one example, but we do a lot of other uh, community work on um, software citation or uh, another one is around how do you cite um, multiple data sets, right? What happens when you get to 50, 100 data sets that you have to cite? And that's another community of practice that we're running. So th these are just examples. And then... Um, the last thing is the special projects and uh, um, just listed out a number of them, um, but you can find uh, what we're working on at data.agu.org. Um, and one that's particularly of interest maybe to this session is RAID, the um, project identifier, which I think we're, we're, we're hoping to explore with ARDC um, of how we can sort of um, ultimately like help ourselves at the end of creating this machine actionability where we can actually create statements and other things from outcomes um, so that we have less confusion on the author side for them to, to you know, wonder what they write, what, what they should write in their availability statements. So there's some other things in here and I encourage you, you know, to go to data.agu.org. Uh, so Hannah, sorry. <laughs> no, that was great. So I think the, I put this slide here. I mean, we all, this is a community that knows very well about why we share data, but I put this here sort of as a placeholder for why this matters to publishers and why, why I'm here as part of this conversation to some extent. So we know that sharing data leads to better research outcomes. And as Chris said at the very front of this talk, the researcher is really, we wanna put them at the center of what we do. And as publishers, we really, we think of them as, we think of ourselves as really in service of researchers and in service of the research ecosystem. So institutions, librarians, funders, governments, we need to be in service of those communities and in service of making better science. All of the benefits of sharing, of sharing data point to this question of better science. So improved transparency, acceleration of discovery, um, the more transparency and efficiency, the idea that you've improved return on investment, this is really critical to a lot of the key stakeholders here. The crux of what we do as publishers is to drive these better outcomes for our researchers. And that's why we care, that's why we're here. And then there's also this in encouraging evidence that having site sharing your data and specifically sharing it through a data availability statement has a positive impact on the visibility of your research article. And we know that that's critical to researchers. That's also critical to publishers, as well as all the other stakeholders involved here. Um, so that's that's another kind of major driver for us. You can go to the next slide, Chris. So, oops, I think one. 
before. I yeah. skipped, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Threw me completely for a loop. Um, so there's a clear call to action here in this for publishers, and it's it's the implementation of these availability statements. It's easy for us, and it's something that, that we can do at scale. Um, we look at availability statements as for as a way of sharing the data and the software and where that's available across the kind of full scope of the options that that may in, entail. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, and just a quick kind of note on what these availability statements are and, and what they do. So we make sure that these are in the HTML version and in the PDF. And in the HTML, they're in front of the paywall, which seems only natural, but for publishers can be a question of whether or not we, we bury this or put this right up front. Um, and then we provide flexibility around the data availability statements right now to fit various communities. So we don't have strict parameters here. We're not saying that we require data sharing or we require a DOI or a PID. We, we're saying that this is a place for a researcher to communicate where their data is available or not. Um, you can go to the next slide for a little bit more on that. So we have we think of our policies around data sharing or software sharing in these four major categories. We have encourages, expects, mandates, and then mandates and peer review. And so this is sort of from the, the spectrum of the lightest touch to the heaviest touch. Um, we've leaned in as a company on expects data sharing, which is kind of one step up from this very, very lightweight encourages. So expects data sharing has four, has a four major components for us, that work for us. So one is that this is suited to communities that do have a lot of data sharing requirements or that's part of the culture and for communities that don't have that. We're a huge publisher. Many of the publishers are large in terms of the scope of what we cover and the communities that we represent. So we wanted a policy for Wiley that works across all of these different groups. Um, the other key pieces here is that it requires the data availability statement. Again, it doesn't require that you share your data. It doesn't require where that goes or how we do that, um, but it requires that you have this data availability statement. Um, and it also is part of that, it requires if you do, if you are able to cite your data and encourages that data citation. And we're working right now on a project with AGU to really facilitate data citation to answer some of those questions about what this means for the researcher, how you do this, and then on a really practical level, how you tag it so it gets all the way from the submission system to Crossref, how it kind of transports through all of these systems. Um, but we see this as a really exciting opportunity to actually give credit to researchers for what they're doing. Um, and then looking on where we go from here. So there are kind of three major categories and three major challenges. So the first is in this complexity question. Communicating your research is already complex, it's already hard, and authors face so many barriers to publishing their work. So the key question for us is how do we introduce these additional requirements if we're going to be leaning towards an, a requiring data sharing policy? How do we do that without creating additional challenges and additional barriers? And this becomes even more challenging when we look at the global scale of what we want to do here. How do we have a, a a kind of one size fits all ish sort of approach that works for a researcher uh, in China versus one in the US versus one in Africa. How do we make sure that this is something that that doesn't become another barrier? The second question here is around standards. So as I mentioned, we published 2000 or 200,000 articles across 1600 journals. We represent 600 scholarly societies. Each of those, many of those are in different subject areas. We need policies and processes that work at scale, especially when we're talking about this, the machine actionable part of this, we need to have standards within our systems that actually work and can and can be inflexible, but then also provide that flexibility for different communities. And last, and I, I think to me the most exciting or interesting part here is around incentives. So right now, according to Sherpa um, Juliet, only 19% of OA funders encourage data sharing and 28% require. So how do publishers partner with funders, institutions, repositories to be part of this culture change. Where do we fit into this equation in a way that we're not, um, I think Shelley often says that we don't wanna be the stick, we wanna provide a carrot. That's really important to us. We wanna be part of the partnership element of this and the support, um, not just another kind of blocker in the road for a researcher or any of these stakeholders. So I think that's it from me, Chris. Thanks, Hannah. I'm trying to advance the slides right now. <laughs> okay. 
And and by the way, our our, our colleague uh, Shelley Stahl couldn't uh, make it to here today. Um, so uh, Shelley is someone I work with at uh, in data leadership at AGU. Um, but our question is, what are the gaps? What are we missing with uh, data management plans and data data availability statements that we can work with you on improving? Um, and it would be great to hear your ideas of what what we can um, work on, sort of improving together. So this is the Menti time. And it's a free text, so start adding responses right now. It's a tough I question. Guess. Okay, there we go. Provenance data. Okay, so yeah, I think just tracking where the data is coming from. I <laughs> question mark question. <laughs> uh, okay, not enough templates in local languages. Yeah, that that's that's something at least from what I see where. Um, our editors and um, reviewers are often saying um, we need things translated to English. Um, you know, there there are, as as uh, Hannah was saying, there are repositories all over the place. Increasingly, in China, we see as well uh, that we're working with, and uh, translating is is something that comes up often. Yeah, the examples. Like this is... one. Sorry. <laughs> Not a blocking issue, but. <laughs> yeah, um, they're connected, the data, data availability statement and the data management plan. Um, and I can tell you why. <laughs> we, we often, from the data help desk at AGU, um, receive questions where we we could have helped the researchers at the beginning of their planning process. And so re really these things are sort of interlinked of like them choosing their repository early on so they know um, some of the things that come up later on, which is, you know, does, is, is the repository able to preserve the data, right? If it's, if it's a large data that we're talking about or um, structuring, help with structuring their data so that they, they're really interconnected, these. Um, so, I don't know, Hannah, you want to take over some of these too? There's one publisher. Uh, well, I was just thinking about the idea that the, the data management plan, authors who don't have a data management plan or haven't done that work, when they get to the data availability statement part, struggle. And those are the authors that we get the most questions from. Um, so it's, it's not to say that publishers don't have a critical role here in enforcing on that side, but we do need to be part of that whole, This it's a whole process that has to start so much earlier than the point of publication. And my, my video, here we go, similar to publishers. Just, just, it's a great question. I think the question around the publishers that having an ethics approval, I think that's a great suggestion. Some of this, I think we would also, I would love to see us pilot these approaches on one title or in one community, get feedback and figure out how we can evolve and change. But that's the kind of thing that we could, we could try in a small scale. Oh yeah, we're thinking about that. <laughs> we have many sections in AGU. <laughs> so definitely thinking about those sort of um, use cases to help with this, but I think we're set so we can move on um, to Tamas. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Hey, hello, everyone. I assume you can see my screen. Um, I'm going to talk for the next 10 minutes on data management plans. And for those who are familiar with the work of LDA, the first few slides will be a repetition, but it will be a good chance for those who are here for the first time to get more 
ideas on what MAD and MPs really are. And in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to show you some ideas of how we can realize the vision of what is the title of this session. So how can we actually make it possible that all the author has to do is to cite a, a DMP, in this case, an MADMP. And I'm here presenting today as the chair of the LDA working group that uh, developed the recommendation on machine actionable data management plans. So let's start with a brief definition of what MADMPs are. And the main assumption is that they are a living document that help to automate data management tasks. And by automating these tasks, we mean being able to pull information from systems, systems, for example, acting on behalf of different stakeholders, like information on uh, administrative data, on the costs of data management, on the licenses needed, and to put that information into a data management plan, but also to trigger actions in other systems. So when we have, once we have this information in this machine actionable DMP, there may be, for example, an, um, an information for the repository that there is a planned submission of big amount of data, or maybe a research support is getting informed that the researcher is finishing writing the DMP and there is a review of the DMP needed. From the side of the um, founders, uh, there is a possibility to improve the validation because when the information is in a structured way, it matches it navigated through it and through a free from text that every researcher writes currently. But to implement the vision, the idea of machine actionable data management plans, we need three things. We need to understand who is responsible for what. So what is the role of each of the stakeholders? We must have a data management infrastructure. So these are, the, for example, the tools that some of you were asking in the chat what do I do to create an, an MADMP? So you basically need such tools that consume this information and, and produce it. And we must have a common way to represent the information so that all of us have the same way to express the contents of MAD, of MADMPs. It doesn't mean asking the same questions to the researchers, but representing them in the same way. And I'm going to show you what it means by representing in the same way. So if you look at this slide, in the top part of this slide, you can see a way the tools typically represent now this non-machine actionable information. They basically break it down into a set of questions and answers. So here you can see that uh, there is a question about who is going to be a contact person for the DMP. And the answer is John Smith from our university. So this is very vague. We don't know what is our university. We don't know who is John Smith. On the bottom of the slide, you can see more or less the same information, but model this information independent of the question. So we know that the contact point is John Smith. We know its address. We have the identifier. We know this identifier is ORCID. So this is what, uh, what, what the machine actionable DMP looks like. It's not something that the researchers are supposed to work with, but this is essential for us as a way to exchange information between the systems and be able to take some actions. Um, a research data alliance uh, has worked together uh, to formulate a recommendation which has been issued uh, already uh, in 2019. And this recommendation provides a list of fields that uh, one can use to express contents of DMPs. So it's not a questionnaire and it's not a template. It's basically a way uh, for people to represent this information in a machine actionable way. And each of the funders and each of the settings you must identify which fields you want to use to express your, your information. So this is an excerpt from the, from the documentation of the standard. So you can see fields like contact, contributor, cost, data set. There is a description information whether this field is obligatory or uh, optional. Uh, but now as the RDA produced the recommendation and, and you know how it looks like, you may wonder actually, so how do I use these MADMPs? And the, the best definition of an MADMP is that it's a glue between different systems. So in this figure, you can see that DMP has the central role and it can act, for example, as a way to exchange information with funders, but it can also be used to get information from uh, repositories or from registries of repositories on where the data is stored, or for example, on information like what is the quality of service of repositories. 
So we don't have to ask researchers uh, how often are the backups made in your repository uh, or how much it costs, because this can be provided automatically. So this is one of these examples. Uh, I'm not going to go deep into this, but basically MADMPs can be seen as a way to automate getting information in and out from the systems. Uh, currently, the recommendation is being adopted in different uh, settings. We have basically all of the uh, major DNP tool providers. Uh, so we have colleagues from Data Structure Wizard, from Argos, from DNP Online, DNP tool in the US. Uh, we also uh, have projects in which uh, DNP tools are being embedded in the infrastructure to communicate with other services like Fair Data Austria or Norwegian Center for uh, Research Data and Haplo, uh, which is not in, uh, it is in this slide. So there is a lot of coming activities, different products are being built, but what maybe is more interesting to you is what specifically we can think of, uh, what kind of automations, what kind of connections we can do. And this is an example of a new opportunity we have. So here we have three stakeholders that we can connect using the MADMPs. So we have the researchers, repository operators and funders. And one of the possible use cases is that researchers uh, can uh, look for similar DMPs if they are able to easily analyze the contents of MA DMPs because they are structured documents. And they can also provide information on, for example, data sets. So how long are they going to uh, keep them under embargo and in which repository and what will be the license? And that's, this, this information can be sent within a DMP to the repository operators and they don't have to ask again the same questions to researchers when they are depositing the data. This information can be set automatically for the selected data sets. And in return, information on costs of storage and, for example, the DOIs which have been minted for these data sets can be fed back into the DMP. And this information in turn is something that the funders would like to know because the funders, as we have seen from the previous presentations, would like to know what data was produced, where it is, how much it costs and so on. So this information can be passed from the DNP, MA DNP to the funder. So this is one of these uh, examples of integrating different stakeholders, um, let's say conceptually without looking now in the details of how to implement it. But let's now focus on the uh, core question of this uh, meeting, like what if all the author needed to cite was a DNP? So what does it mean to actually just cite a DNP? And this is my proposal, feel free to, to disagree. This comes entirely from me, not from, from LDA. So what I believe what we would need is a central place to store all the MADMPs. And that's why in this figure, you can see an MADMP store where the DMPs are stored and versioned, in, versioned to reflect all the changes because they are the living documents. We have the recommendation from LDA that tells, tells us how to uh, express the MADMP. This store must assign the MADMP PID, so present identifier for each of the MADMPs. And then we have the author who wants to create uh, the, uh, the, the, the DMP. So currently how it happens is that the author answers some questions using any of the DMP tools and such a DMP would be submitted to such a central service central store. One novel possibility that we have when using uh, machine actionable data management plans that I described in the previous slide is that author can also submit data to data repositories and small updates on the data uploaded to the data repository could go into such store. So that's why you can see this icon of a, of a document with this green, uh, highlighting the, this, this green block, but it's just an update going to this, to this uh, MADMP store. So the new version of a DMP is created with updated information on the data sets deposited into the repository by the author. And as a result, the, the author would get an MADMP ID and author would just go to someone else, to funder, publisher, to a friend, to the reusing researcher and would say, hey, this is the present identifier for my MADMP. In case you need some information, that's just an identifier you get, you will get anything from there. So how could it work on the other side? We would have the MADMP store and let's say a publisher has this identifier and uh, accesses the store. And here is something we might discuss as a community. 
Should the publisher be seeing the whole DMP or maybe some sections of the DMP or MA DMP are relevant to the publisher? That's why I highlighted it in blue, that only part of the file may be relevant to the publisher. If you give this identifier to the funder, the funder having a different role should likely see more content of the DMP. So maybe it should see all the data sets and costs, but maybe it doesn't need to know the security details of, of, of how the data is protected. Maybe, I'm just guessing trying to invent an example here. Uh, another use case which we could have by just using the identifier for such a DMP would be this idea of publishing the DMPs. So creating a service which would be able to fetch this machine actionable DMPs and display it in a, in, a, in a repository style, in a kind of an archive style, like for the preprint, I mean like for the preprints, have a service where everyone, meaning all other researchers, the publicity could go and search for DMPs. They would only uh, they would also only see, for example, subsets of information that can be made officially public. Not everything in the DMP must be made public automatically. And the reusing researcher, and this is basically the answer to our question, uh, what if all the author needed to decide was a DMP? The author would give such an identifier to the reusing researcher, and such a researcher could get access to the DMP. So uh, to sum up on this idea, we have currently the common standard for expressing MADMPs. We have tools to export and import MADMPs, and here I mean the MADMP tools, there's like uh, those tools that are adopting the recommendation. But we still need as a community to make some developments. We still need to create some services. So publishers and funders would need tools to actually fetch the DMPs and, and to display them and, and validate them in, in an automated way. Repositories still need to integrate with the uh, MA DMPs. Uh, we need a clear uh, definition of who should be able to see which part of a DMP. So there is still work for a community, but this community, but this work has to be jointly, not only by one group, but all groups of stakeholders. And this is basically my conclusion for today, that uh, for the next steps, we must interconnect systems and stakeholders using MA DMPs. And we must continue the development of services exchanging MADMPs because this development has already started and it's a matter of continuation. Uh, since I'm running out of time, uh, this is it from my side when it comes to the presentation. Here are some useful links linked to the specification and to other papers. So this uh, link is available after the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, T Tomas. You have actually some questions. If while well, while we're getting Minty prepared here, um, mm -hmm. but some of the questions, if you see them in the chat, or if you want me to read them, I can see the chat. So uh, there is a comment from uh, from Steffi. Uh, is the machine actionable DMP readable for normal people? Maybe it need both current DMP and machine actionable one. Well, uh, it's not really meant to be read by people. So yes, we need tools to present this information in a human-friendly way. So either we have, either we can have both standard one and an ADMP, or we just provide the tools to visualize that information. This is still to, this is still open. Um, the next one is from Maria Cruz. Uh, thanks, Tomas. I didn't I didn't mention costs in my presentation, but costs are obviously important for funders. So I guess this is a statement, not a question. Uh, Ellie, do you mean that we need a new store? Open air harvests outputs from data repositories and can play this role already through the research graph. Uh, yes, this could be this could be a solution. So I Basically, when I was drafting this picture, this architecture, I didn't have any specific solution in mind. It was more to show that we cannot um, shift the whole responsibility on the DMP uh, tool developers, that everyone should have the freedom to choose the tool they like to use. And then there has to be this interoperability between the tools. And for example, they may all submit their DMPs to one central point. And there is a comment from Sue. Uh, in my university, DMPs are required for industry-sponsored projects too. 
and such DMPs are not suitable to be made open. Will it still be possible to make private DMPs machine actionable? Of course, machine actionability has, is independent of the fact whether something is public or private and access control can, can, can handle that. So you can use machine actionable DMPs in your own uh, context uh, for sure. Uh, there is one more. Uh, people interested in NA DMPs, I'm one, like to see the NA DMP at the center of many things. Are we wrong? For many stakeholders, in particular researchers, DMPs are very peripheral at best. What do you think? Uh, hmm. I need to think about the answer. Maybe you can prove the, the, the question to the uh, to, to the, the breakouts. Breakout yes. Because there's too many questions, I think, to, to answer. I thought it's like two or three, but let's discuss all these questions in the in the breakouts. I see you have started already the menti. So back to you, uh, Ellie. <laughs> Yes, so we have the first question here where on the Menti, where do you see the biggest potential of using mass in actionable DMPs to interconnect systems stakeholders? There are three answers already. Um, so don't uh, go back and enter um, many times uh, information for, for data, um, things that have to do with data reuse, Managing other versions to keep it as a living document. Um, provide access to more contextualized information when searching. Third principles, and I like that this uh, went in the middle. It seems to be uh, by default a, a core component to the discussions. Um, I'm just typing. I don't know if you want to, to, to comment on some of this. Mm -hmm. Comments that have to do with um, workflows being repeated and um, DOIs at the different stages of the DMP, transparency of the research process, integrated with CRIS systems, credits to the authors. Okay, I think we, we should move on because we, we want to have a, a discussion with you also during the breakout. So I'll move on to the next. Who can best drive the change from DMPs to my DMPs? Answer yet? Maybe my connection is slow. Also, okay. So funders, the tool providers, then publishers, then independent organizations. Still, top three are funders and DNP tool providers and independent organizations. Then we have uh, fourth place for repository operators, fifth for publishers, and sixth for researchers. How much uh, would you like to comment on that? Otherwise, we can. I was focusing on the on the on the chat, uh, so I don't want to take any more time of the meeting. I think we should switch to the next presenter. Okay, so um, let's discuss that during the breakout. Then, who can benefit, or let's. Uh, Provide one one minute until it's six uh, five thirty. So one more minute for that. You can benefit most from my DMPs. 
So this question is mostly about where do you see the biggest uh, benefits of doing all these integrations? So we have the DMP tools, we have the format to exchange, and if we do the integration, who will be benefiting most? So is that the funders because their life becomes easier, or is the the researchers because they have less things to do to type, for example, or this can help us as the community set the focus on which of the services, which of the use cases we want to work out first before we focus on the other use cases. That's the intention of this question. So it's mostly on the researcher's side, citing or writing the DMP, then it's funders, research support, infrastructure and the postal providers. Oh, now it's switched. It's infrastructure providers and research support, and then publishers. Now they... Okay, uh, I'm, uh, I see that we are 10 minutes behind time, so... Uh, Thomas, if you want to, if you don't want to comment or maybe you want to, to handle that. Okay, I guess we can uh, stop and we can uh, continue discussions about those issues at the breakout sessions. And then I uh, move on to presenting my uh, slides here. Okay. All right. Uh, present. Great. So, um, yeah, again, hi, everyone. I am Elva Kodopoulou. I work for Athena Research and Medicine Center in Greece, which uh, is uh, uh, an organization that uh, works uh, on the field of ICT and very uh, you know, a leader in, in Greece on data science and, and open science, uh, connected to many uh, infrastructures for research and services for data management. Uh, and my presentation will focus on uh, my um, uh, on providing you a bit of uh, background on some challenges recent from recent from recent studies. Uh, so challenges that we see uh, are there for. Um, uh, DMPs and how the tools that have been built to support machine actionability of DMPs can uh, facilitate our, discuss our discussions and provide solutions on those challenges. So I will concentrate on uh, that the second part will be about Argos, which is the machine actionability tool uh, of OpenAir. Um, a background of two major, um, a very recent studies, one about the data management plans of uh, the Horizon uh, uh, 2020, um, and this is a study that was conducted by the uh, Open Air uh, NOAD in Austria, uh, where uh, we uh, also, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this work was supported also by the Research Data Management Task Force of OpenAir and what uh, uh, this was about uh, to understand how we can um, move, how we can move uh, things forward to supporting the beneficiaries of uh, the risk uh, who have received the grants in the different, um, in the different projects, how we can support them, uh, what is missing uh, in terms of research data management and DMPs um, awareness. Uh, so here you can see what they did, and, and I concentrate on that only. What they did is that they took uh, the uh, open uh, the, the data that about the MPs that are openly available uh, to everyone from Cordis, and uh, what they did is uh, try to uh, understand how they could uh, red redistribute it. And what they find out was that. Actually, although that you can find them in Cordis, uh, you are you don't know how to how to reuse them or how to use them. So we're moving uh, back to the the, to the whole open access um, uh, issues um, for for that uh, in terms of how DMPs uh, when we're talking about DMPs uh, availability and DMPs sharing, uh, it's not clear. So you see uh, most of the ERC. Um, 
um, DMPs were uh, public status, the public status was unclear, some others were confidential, some were not a DMP, there were project management plans, for example, or under dissemination activities, uh, they, they were mentioned there, and uh, a, 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 large, a larger part was uh, okay, uh, and they took it as their sample to, to provide their, um, their results. So one thing uh, we see is that it's not easy to understand how we can use other DMPs that are publicly available there. Another thing from the same uh, study uh, was this, uh, some major challenges that were addressed by having interviews with the beneficiaries. Uh, and I highlight those three points here, where to put uh, the focus and how much detail to give on the level of uh, when you're writing a DMP and when you're answering all those questions uh, that the template um, requires to answer, they are not aware of how much um, detail they should go into. Uh, when providing an answer, they are not, uh, the, the technicalities are not clear for them to understand most of the times. And um, some of them uh, do not, uh, so researchers don't know how to start uh, a DMP, where to start from. Uh, so uh, I guess this is also where the DMP templates and the DMP tools come to provide answers. Another study, very recent, uh, two weeks ago, I think, was about Horizon uh, Europe open access analysis, uh, the, the open access analysis. You can find this here. Uh, let me also paste it in the chat, all the links that are, uh, about the studies that I'm uh, mentioning. So one thing that we see here uh, on the study about how open access has evolved um, is that the standard says here, the standard does not necessarily highlight and will solve uh, the problem of DMPs, recording pool of information. Uh, so DMPs is collectively addressing all projects data sets and that po poses obstacles in the evaluation and exploitation of individual data sets when we want to uh, go and uh, understand the different elements uh, highlighted on the level of data set uh, in the DMPs. Uh, and that, go here, and that means that it's difficult to identify uh, the granularity uh, of, of those data sets uh, as they are uh, in, to separate, them, to separate them from other data sets that are all collectively addressed in a DMP. Uh, second one is uh, DMPs can be harvested in many ways, depending on how they have been published. They can be found classified with diverse labels, like articles, reports, uh, publications, etc. This means that repository providers need to specify their resource types of DMPs in their systems and promote them widely so that researchers are aware of and use them. Oops, sorry. And that has to do with the system. So we see that uh, some, uh, some challenges are addressed to uh, the systems, some challenges are addressed to, ha to, to, the, um, to the repositors, others to the DMP tools, and we have to all come together and uh, face and uh, provide solutions to them. And about reusability, another thing from the same study um, uh, showed that uh, it is difficult to identify the reused data. Here you can see why. Uh, there were there are no labels, for example, to do so. It, it's not easy to understand which data have been produced or have been reused in, in a single DMP. So um, we are not sure uh, about uh, the the uptake of uh, reusability, and we can all, only uh, rely on assumptions when we exploit those data. So Argos comes to uh, provide um, to provide uh, solutions to most of, of those points that I uh, that I covered before. Uh, Argos, uh, as I mentioned, is a tool that Opener developed, co-developed with uh, UDAT, and now it runs uh, and is maintained by Opener. It's also an EOS resource. Uh, it's uh, open source. You can find the, the you can find here the, the source code. Uh, in the GitLab repository, it's configurable and extensible. You can use it, you can download it, and you can learn more about Argos. Actually, we have a session uh, uh, right after this session. There is a, a demo, and I'm happy to, to provide you more information about that. Um, so Argos comes to solve um, not only the writing uh, of DMPs, but also the publication of DMPs, 
uh, and provide a, provide a good way of publishing DMPs according to open and fair principles. It's based on the templating system uh, that has dynamic uh, and static parts to accommodate also what Thomas uh, showed in his presentation with the access points that are required uh, with uh, the uh, integrations with the uh, uh, RDA standard and so on. And uh, yes, so we you don't only generate, you also publish DMPs uh, with Argos according to open fair principles. You have at the end, um, you can pub, you can export the DMP uh, in machine readable and machine actionable um, files, file formats. Uh, you can use it to uh, create data set profiles and implement data domain protocols by doing so. Uh, and so you can um, you can you can use it to address different issues that uh, that uh, apply to different data sets uh, and highlight them under a new profile, like for new data sets, for reuse data sets, for sensitive data sets, discipline specific data sets, and I will show them and on the demo later. Uh, you can, um, because it's connected, it's it's an Argos, uh, it's it's an open uh, service. It's connected to all the all its ecosystem, all the the infrastructure. It utilizes the infrastructure of Opener, uh, and it uh, by doing so, it is contextualized. The outputs are contextualized and can be exploitable uh, through integrations with the monitor uh, and uh, the mining systems that we have. Uh, and we also make sure that we um, contribute to the standardization of global practices. So, for example, uh, last year, um, we, during the, like August, September last year, we um, uh, we we applied, uh, we worked with Zenodo uh, to um, be sure that the DMPs that are exposed from uh, Argos are. Uh, are classified under the correct resource type and they are uh, enhancing this their vulnerability. Uh, this is how you can publish a DMP scenario. I'm not going to go into my studio. I want to stay to state here that uh, this is uh, the output at the end. Uh, it's versioned. Uh, it's um, uh, it has DOI. It has a, a, a license, so it's easy for everyone to understand how to use them. So it actually it ticks the box from the challenge that I addressed before. And it has all these different uh, elements on top, preserved as a model, uh, and so on, uh, to, to even enhance uh, the practices. Um, and how you can identify the different data sets included on, in the DMP is by having this uh, profiling system uh, where uh, you can uh, select the template that you want, the data set template that you want each time. So, for example, if you would like to uh, use the reuse the, the, the template that is meant to have questions for reuse data, you choose this. If you want to use the template for the other research outputs, you can use that. And th these are different. So the questions uh, are different from each other, and they um, uh, are sensitive to uh, the community. Also, if it's uh, if it's a community that has uh, created it. Uh, and to the funder's requirements as well. Uh, here is how you can uh, create a machine actionable template and how you can control the, uh, or the, the machine actionability by making the mapping to the RDA uh, standard uh, structure, but I'm not going to go too much detail because I know that we don't have time and we can come to the next session if we want to learn more. And this is how we connect to opener and uh, facilitate all this interlinking. And again, what, what Thomas was mentioning before, how we um, integrate with Zenodo uh, to uh, publish the DMPs in the correct way, how we uh, also enable this communication with the different providers, uh, how we uh, contextualize within the research graph the, the, DMP informa the DMPs information. This is why I think uh, our opener would be a good um, a pilot for, for that store that was mentioned before, uh, and uh, how we push things, uh, the data to the monitor to provide uh, some sort of indicators and analytics for the DMPs. Uh, also, we test some evaluate, some first evaluation validation um, criteria, and uh, how we can find them uh, from the explorer. Uh, but and to return back to the subject of this session, 
about the data uh, availability, including also the data availability statements. Uh, I would like to, um, to say that at least are we uh, in Argos see two, um, two, two uh, solutions. The one is very minimum. Uh, that means that we just add, we create the link from adding a question that just has a reference to the data, uh, the data availability statement and to the publication that this relates to. Uh, but then the, the more complex one uh, comes when we're talking about machine actionability. And this is uh, one thing that we are going to be focusing now to uh, during the breakout sessions. Thank you very much. I'm happy to have any questions. Um, but I'm mindful of the time and I don't, I, I won't go to the questions on the menti. I will just straight move to the um, breakouts. So. We have 15 minutes left. I'm not sure maybe we should skip the breakouts and just to the menti and open discussion, but. Let's do it like, yes. Let's handle it like this, yes. Yeah, yeah. There, we just have 10, 10 minutes or so. <laughs> so if there are additional questions, yeah. So let's have a discussion now. We are 32 people, so that's fine. You can do Menti if you want. Sure. Which of the following is most in, is most important I wanted to to write uh, for you. And there are some quite some um, answers there that you can choose from. In the meantime, let me see if, I, if there are any questions. Ah, the, the Manticore, sorry, yes. It's, you can also see it in the screen, it's 4807746. How it captures the provenance, data provenance. Uh, this is, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm answering as, as we go with the Menti. Uh, how Argos captures the data provenance. This is not, at the moment we are, in trials uh, with provenance, um, we rely on um, on repositories for that. But uh, at the moment, it's just the basic uh, track of the history, let's say, uh, through the versioning mechanisms that, that we employ. Um, but this is uh, this is enhanced uh, as as we speak. Okay, so, um, so first is DMPs linked to data, software, and other information. This seems to be crucial, uh, important for people. DMPs for reporting and analytics, DMPs being machine actionable, DMPs having DOIs. These are the four uh, pre pre-filling of DNPs. And also, I'm, I'm also, um, so there's a question in the chat. Is it possible to deposit the DMP to the node directly from Argos? Uh, yes, we have integrated Argos and we are uh, working to integrate other repositories uh, with Argos just to, to, to be inclusive. So yes, it just just uh, you just click, you select if you want to be um, uploading that under your name or under Argos um, credentials, and it's automatically uh, there. Alan, I think you're so. Is it a discussion that I'm missing here? Maybe. I think you're right. That's why when you integrate my DMPs with other services to silently source the needed information so that it happens in the meantime and the input time effort from researchers is minimalized. 
that was my answer to one of the questions. Ah, we sorry, I don't see that. <laughs> Uh, it was, uh, we were supposed to discuss it in the breakout session, and since there is no breakout session, I didn't want to leave it unanswered. I couldn't see who. who okay. <laughs> Sorry for confusion. Okay, so uh, let's let's see the, the results. Are DMP is linked to data, software, and other information, then followed by DMP for reporting and analytics. DMP has been machine actionable. Uh, pre filling of DMPs. DMPs having DOIs and enabling data set profiling in DMPs. Okay, moving on to the next. Next. What is the most challenging for DMP tools integration for those of you that have tried it either as providers or as um, uh, you know, as providers mainly? So either in the institutions or in, in different uh, settings. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first is policy recommendations. Mm -hmm. Then research, no. Okay, I'll wait a few minutes before I start working. Mm -hmm. So the most challenging right now is create links with other services. Then it's research culture. Then it's maintenance. Okay. Then it's DMP tool data model modifications, policy recommendations, deployment, and create new services to link to, I guess. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, I don't know if anyone from uh, the rest of the speakers would like to, to comment also on that, because it's policies like uh, Maria, maybe you would like to comment or how much for, for the rest, or Hannah, Chris. Well, yeah, just at least from my my side that I can see the culture is a um, is a real real challenge, and same with uh, um, uh, funders as well, sort of driving you know, things. But um, yeah, the the culture and sort of skills side of things um, is 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 still moving pretty slowly. <laughs> and just to add to that, I think the first. The number one here, the creating links with other services points to that question around ease and the idea that there's so many things that researchers have to do and are responsible for. So we have to make this easy and kind of there are technology solutions, there are culture solutions, there's sort of a number of different areas that we need to tackle. Yeah, that... today, today, today in the chat there were a few questions about which tool I can use, what can I do? So I would say that there is already kind of a change in the culture that people are not anymore questioning why do we have to do that, but now they are asking actually how can I do it in an efficient way? And this is already a big change. Maybe. Yeah, I, I was just going to support what Hannah said too about just making things easy. Again, that's what we see sort of researchers gravitating to is, um, in fact, I have one example, which is um, when, when we provide guidance to researchers on repositories, we often guide them to discipline specific then institutional, then, you know, the, gen the general repositories, um, you know, often we see them actually gravitate to the general repositories because they're easier, you know, for them to use and deposit 
their data in. And so we see those trends, um, you know, in, in uh, our availability statements and citation. Well, I can just have one example from, from our university here in Austria that very often the center where I work with will provide guidance to the researchers who are writing the DMPs. And we don't see any complaints about European Commission forcing people to write DMPs as at the beginning of the uh, project. And also now with this new proposal template where we have to write a short statement of how we're going to do with data. They also don't complain. They, they take it like, if it's a requirement, I will do that. Uh, and there is no questioning of, of, of that. And I, nobody has called us ever and said, how oh, this is so weird, we don't want to do that. So again, this is something I was saying that they want to get answers from us. They are interested. They believe that it has something to do with the reproducibility, scientific reputation, good practice. And I really see a decrease in the amount of trainings we give in which we just explain the importance of doing things correctly. We don't have to do that anymore, and this is great. I, I wanted to add to something you said, Thomas, that you see researchers um, starting to use, you know, start starting to, to actually do these types, the things that we're talking about, sort of depositing their data software. I, I, I just have an example that in our community, the software was sort of driven to the forefront about sharing. And so, you know, the, yeah, the, I, I mentioned the culture. Um, I think that, that that's a challenge, but it's also sort of rewarding to see that um, people are sort of moving, you know, when, when we were working on our data guidance, there was also sort of the drive to say, you know, well, there's more to that. There's software and you know we've released guidance on Jupyter notebooks, and um, it it you know I think there's there's a, definitely see seeing that drive towards recognizing all these other other research outputs. I do think there's a, a piece here around the incentives that when it's connected to a funder and the idea that getting money for your research is dependent on doing a DMP and and or or any other requirements, it's much more palatable. Similarly. With our journals, the journals that are that kind of highest impact, whatever that means for what you know, whatever community that is, um, we don't see complaints about data mandates or data sharing or data availability statements um, from any authors because they're much more willing and open to do whatever needs to be done to get published in those titles. It's more of when there isn't a clear as clear of an incentive for them, or when the journal isn't quite up to whatever impact standard they have in mind, or you know, there's so many different ways that they measure all of this, but that's where I think we see more of that friction with researchers. I'll just say this, I was typing, <laughs> responding to Thomas, but if anyone wants to, uh, um, has a, a last question or, or comment, uh, it'd be great. I'm just wondering whether we, in any way, answered the question of the session. So, what if the author needed to cite was a DMP? That's a good question. So there is a comment from Gabriela, the requirements must make sense, then they are acceptable. I think everyone agrees with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was head, not, head nodding. <laughs> I, think, I think that is a great way to capture it. Um, and I immediately think about the COVID measures and how people comply with them and how they don't comply and how they differ from country to country. So we've got thanks from Steffi. Thanks for some compliments. Session. Yeah, compliments. Thank you very much. So I think we have one minute left. So I think it's time for us to, to wrap up. So Ellie, yes. I think Steffi, <laughs> Steffi gave us our, our cue. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So 
yeah, I, 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 I don't think I have much to say um, and uh, I'll let Ellie uh, say the closing remarks, but just that I saw a lot of um, alignment with our, our initial themes, you know, that we had in the, in the intro slides. So, um, but yeah, Ellie. I think that we can uh, continue this discussion uh, and uh, you know see see how it evolves uh, through. Not don't wait two um, two years for the next OS fair, but through other means like the RDA, like the opener, like other other forum uh, fora. Uh, sorry, and continue the discussions. Uh, and you know uh, keep everyone up to date with what we're doing. Because again, I will reference yesterday's keynote. Uh, we, we need to uh, to break this the, the, the silos. Uh, that's an irony, but yes, um, and connect uh, connect our knowledge and what we're doing. Uh, and if you want to contact us, we'll have we all have the, uh, our emails uh, left on the slides. So when they are available, you can find them there. Uh, and we're happy to to uh, yeah to to continue the discussions. Ah. Yeah, please reach out. Okay, so yeah, yeah, Thomas, that, that's a good opportunity. So next RDA. Thank you, then. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.